it probably won't have escaped your attention that sales of small SUVs and crossovers are extremely large in Britain, and it's for good reason. These are often great all-rounders with lots of practicality and some very affordable prices. And handily, for this video, we've got six of my favourite small crossovers and SUVs gathered behind me, starting with one of the UK's most popular choices, the Volkswagen T-Cross. Okay, yeah, we're not exactly starting with the most attractive car of the bunch, this T-Cross is pretty conservative when it comes to design, but it does share many parts with its siblings, including the Polo and the Golf, and that's a good thing. Under the bonnet, you've got a one litre TSI engine. In this car, it gets you close to 60 miles per gallon combined, which is pretty good going for a petrol engine. That means it's punchy and affordable to run, and also very functional, and no clearer is that than in here. Now, anyone who's driven a modern Volkswagen will find a lot of familiarity in this T-Cross interior. It's very functional, as is the Golf and Polo. This car, being an S model, doesn't get the top grade digital instrument cluster that you get in higher spec cars. It's got two analog dials, but you do still have a small digital screen with everything you're gonna to need to know while you're driving. Miles per gallon, how many miles you got left in the tank. It's all very effective and very useful. You do, of course, still get a touchscreen infotainment system in the middle here. And I have to say, while it's not the flashiest one on the market at the moment, and certainly not the flashiest one even in the Volkswagen group, I think it's one of the most effective. It's very fast to respond. It's just simply, simple and easy to use, and everything works really well. I also am very happy that this car has manual controls for the climate control. It means you've got knobs and buttons to press rather than fumbling around in your entertainment screen here. Now, this car, being the 95 brake horsepower model, 100 horsepower, give or take, it has a manual gearbox, and it's a five-speed gearbox, which you might think means it won't do particularly well on motorways, but actually, this three-cylinder engine settles down very, very well. We know it from so many other cars, so I wouldn't be too put off, put off by the fact that it doesn't have a six-speed. Elsewhere, you've got storage space down here, USB port here, really wide cubby holes in the doors, cup holders, and a bit more storage down here. And look, oh, a manual handbrake. Don't see many of these very often, do you? Now, in the back, it's actually very spacious. This is effectively a hatchback on stilts, but it means you've got a lot more headroom than you would in a conventional hatchback. And the legroom here is actually very good. I'm only just under six foot. The seat is as I'd have it. And I'm very comfortable here. I've got lots and lots of knee room. Also, these seats are pretty wide. It means you've actually got quite a wide middle seat here. You could probably quite comfortably carry three teenagers. Maybe if I was a fully grown adult, I wouldn't want to spend a long time here. But come on, this is pretty good for what is effectively quite a compact crossover. Also, I should say the ride in this car is really good. This is a passive dampered car, means you can't change from comfort to sport for your damping, but it rides really nicely, even in the back here. Now, in the boot of the T-Cross, you've got about 385 litres of space. If that means nothing to you, it's enough room for a big suitcase here and maybe a medium-sized one on top, plus a few throw-on bags as well. But if you've got more bags to put in, perhaps one of the kids' suitcases, you probably have to make use of the storage space under the floor here. Currently, in this car, we've got a tyre repair kit under here, but it is removable. You could take that out and throw that small suitcase in there as well. So it's not the biggest boot, but actually, when it comes to this class, it's pretty competitive. Although, when it comes to boots, this one has a special surprise. This is a Ford Puma, and it's heavily related to the Ford Fiesta, which I have to say is easily one of my favorite cars out there. Now, this car actually is in a higher spec titanium grade, so it's a bit higher rank than the T-Cross we just looked at, yet it starts from just over 18,000 pounds in this grade here, used on cinch, and of course you can get cheaper ones for around 17 grand. Now, this car has a one liter engine as well, a three cylinder just like that T-Cross, but with a little bit more power. This one's got 125 horsepower and it will do close to 60 miles per gallon if you're really sensible. I very much like the motor in this car and I really like the gearbox as well. I also like the styling. I think it's quite fun and quirky. And inside, I think the interior is just really nice. Have a look. Now, okay, I'm going to admit that most people aren't going to get particularly excited about this interior, but me personally, the things I like about it are mainly related to the seating position and the way Ford has very carefully thought about aligning everything with where the driver sits. They did that in the Fiesta, they've done it with this as well. I can sit nice and low in the car, I feel like I'm really part of it. It almost feels a bit sporting. And okay, the screen here, the infotainment screen is pretty small, but the system works fine. 
I actually think aesthetically it's quite good as well. Just like that T-Cross, we don't have a fully digital display up front here, but we do get a slightly wider digital screen in the middle and it is customizable as well. Shows you everything you need to know, fuel consumption, range, all of those things. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the six speed gearbox in this is really good. I think it's nice to use, it's easy. It's just a nice feeling that you get through the gearbox when you're driving the car and it goes well with that punchy motor. Seats as well, even in this titanium model without leather seats, they're comfortable, nice and supportive. I think the fit and finish is really good in these. Lots of space as well, maybe not quite as much as that T-Cross. You get storage space down here, you've got a USB port over here. Okay, the cubby holes in the doors aren't as wide as you get in the Volkswagen, but you've got a couple of cup holders down here. And if I lift this armrest and I remove this little bit of trim out of here, you've got quite a lot of room in there. Oh, and look, there's another USB port as well. Now, I said I really like the way this thing drives, but I have to admit, if you're a passenger in the back, it's pretty cramped. In fact, I've got the seat as I like it set here. And yes, I can tuck my legs under here, but there's noticeably less knee room up here than there was in that Volkswagen. Same goes for headroom. It's not too bad in terms of headroom directly above me, but when it comes to the stuff on the sides here, it's a little bit more cramped. Nothing too bad, but that T-Cross definitely felt a lot more spacious. And it's true as well for the middle seat here. It's noticeably narrower. Again, you wouldn't have any trouble getting three teenagers in here for the school run, but on a longer drive, this seat's definitely a lot smaller. But the party piece of this car is in its boot. So when you pop the boot of the Puma, you might be surprised to see that it doesn't look like there's that much space. In fact, it looks considerably smaller than the T-Cross, despite the fact that on paper, it's supposed to have more room. And the reason for that is very simple. You've got two layers of boot space down here. And actually when you drop the floor lower, it opens up a lot of extra room. So much so that I reckon you'd get a full size suitcase in here plus a medium size and maybe even that smaller child suitcase on top. You might even be able to squeeze in a couple of throw on bags as well. And it gets better because if I take this out, you'll find yourself an 80 litre mega box. And not only is this a storage area where you can throw in, I think probably quite easily a child suitcase, but also if you move this rubber lining at the bottom, you'll notice that there's a little plug hole down there. And that's because this is a waterproof section. It means you can throw wet wellies in there, your swimming costumes, your towels, maybe even a wet dog if you brought them back and they've jumped in the pond. And it means you can hose it out after and then open that plug hole and let it drip through to the floor underneath. Genius. Next up, we've got the Skoda Kamiq, which in this spec here, with just over 5,000 miles on the clock, costs not much more than 15 grand. So this is the value car here today. It shares a lot with that T-Cross, which means it's got really good underpinnings, including that three cylinder engine with about 95 horsepower. It will do well over 50 miles per gallon on a run. But crucially, what matters in this car most is the fact that you get a full size crossover for not much money at all. And inside, there's lots and lots of functionality. Now, not surprisingly, what you've effectively got in this Kamiq is a dressed down version of the interior you find in the T-Cross and other Volkswagens. But of course, it's still very functional. You've got two analog displays ahead of you and the same small digital screen in front of you as well. In the middle shows all those essential details. You've got an infotainment screen here, but it's actually quite noticeably smaller. But come on, it actually works fine. I mean, everything on this is reactive and quick. And because you've got manual buttons here as well, in many ways, it's actually easier to use than some of the other stuff on the market. You've got a proper volume control knob, for example, and these climate control buttons down here and knobs all manually operated. Again, we've got a five-speed manual gearbox to go with that three-cylinder engine, but it's still a relatively new model, this Kamiq, so they've got USB-C ports down there. You do have a couple of cup holders here. Interestingly, the cubby hole down here is a little bit smaller than the one you get in a T-Cross, but there's still plenty of space in there for, say, a reusable water bottle. And you've got a bit of space down here as well. Nice and comfortable, loads of room. It feels very airy up front here. I think it might do in the back as well. There is loads and loads of space in here. Look at that. I've got the seat set as I like it. And yet here I am tucking my feet under here. I've almost got my legs, well, not straight, but they're pretty stretched, aren't they? That's very, very comfortable. And I've got lots of headroom as well to the side as well. And this middle seat, just like that T-Cross, is pretty wide. Very spacious in here. And even these seats as well, when you sit back in them, they sort of bucket around you on your lower back and your, your upper back. So. There's loads of space in here. This is definitely going to be a nice car to spend a long time in, even if you're sat in the back here. In the boot of this Kamiq, surprise, surprise, 
It looks a lot like the T-Cross, which is no bad thing. Good amounts of space down here. You'd easily get a full-size suitcase down here with another one on top. Interestingly, this car comes under the floor here with an actual spare tire. You don't see that very often these days. I think that's very Skoda, isn't it? They give you the proper thing. So it means you do lose a bit of potential storage space down there, but I'm sure a lot of Skoda drivers, especially those who do long distance driving, will very much appreciate the fact that you've got a proper spare wheel in this car down here. So it's very practical, very functional, and great value for money. This is the Peugeot 2008. So if that Skoda was our value for money offering, this thing here, well, it's definitely one of the more premium cars here. This actual car here costs from just over 23 grand, and that's because it's in high spec Allure trim. Look at that shade of paint, really nice. The whole fit and finish on this car is pretty posh. But you can get 2008s for not much more than 10 grand on cinch. But when it gets to the later models like this in this spec, it's over 20K and it's very much worth that money. This, I should also add, is a diesel model. You can, of course, get petrol cars, but this particular car is an HDI diesel model, which means it does well over 60 to the gallon on a run. And it has over 100 horsepower and quite a lot of torque as well. So it's very punchy. I actually think the design of this car could really lure you towards it. I love the features on the front and the back. And inside, they've really gone to town on that Peugeot look. Now there's a lot to talk about in this interior because it's so unique. Peugeot's interiors, and they've deliberately gone in a totally different direction. They are, well, I think they're probably quite divisive because some people will miss the usual functionality you get in slightly more Germanic models, but I actually really like that they've gone off on this slightly odd route. Firstly, the steering wheel is tiny. This is not much bigger than the steering wheel you get in a Caterham sports car, yet here it is in a crossover, and it comes sat in front of a really slim but fully digital, this is a posh model, don't forget, fully digital instrument cluster up here. I have to admit though, with everything set as I like it, the steering wheel does slightly block my view of that screen, and that is something a lot of other journalists have noted. But if you sit a bit more upright, a lot of crossover drivers do, you can see over it quite clearly. Something to note, if you're trying one of these cars, best to get sitting in one first. You do, though, get a nice infotainment screen up here, which, if I can wake it up, is angled directly at the driver. That makes it feel really driver-centric in here. It goes with the small steering wheel. And the screen itself, nice and easy to use. I quite like the graphics. I have to admit, it's not the fastest responding out there, and it's probably not the most intuitive. But I think once you get used to it, it goes with the theme of this car. Same goes for these buttons down here. Look at that. It's almost like fighter jet or sports car-esque really like them all right not quite as easy to use as the twisty knobs you got on the earlier cars but i think once you get used to them at least they're proper buttons and interestingly you get a conventional usb port here and a usb c port down here loads of storage around here you even get a little section that you can hide stuff away in there cubby holes everything you'd expect not masses and masses of storage space quite small cup holders and a little bit down here but it's actually quite nice the way you're cocooned into this interior. It really does feel quite sporting. Now, because this is quite a posh model, instantly when you get in the back, you notice that there's been a big lift in quality compared to the other cars because you've got part leather on the seats. And straight away, I've noticed there are two USB ports down here as well. So when it comes to offering the most value and the most feeling of comfort in the back, I think this car feels really strong. However, I have to note, while there are some strong points in terms of space, loads of knee room here because of the way this seat is pushed in and you've got a little bit of stitching there to hold it tight. It just doesn't feel anywhere near as spacious as that Skoda or the Volkswagen. It feels only a tiny bit bigger in the back here than the Puma, which is to say I've got decent headroom above me, but not too much headroom to the sides here. So maybe taller passengers would be a bit cramped in these seats. The middle seat is a bit wider than the one in the Puma, but certainly not as wide as the ones we had in the Skoda and the Volkswagen. So again, Three teenagers on the school run, no problem. But an adult in that middle seat and a longer drive might get a bit tiring. And you're gonna kick those USBs as well, aren't you? As for the Peugeot's boot, it's quite an interesting one. Because, firstly, there's a good amount of space in here, 434 litres. Again, that's about enough room for a big suitcase, maybe a smaller one. You might struggle to get the kid's suitcase on top of that. But there's more room under here, and this is where things get interesting in this boot. This floor, can be clipped up like this here. So you can have the boot divided into two halves. It's quite impressive actually. It means you could have your shopping in here and maybe your grandmother's shopping in there. Don't get them mixed up, you know, God forbid that would happen. And then you lift up this bit of floor down here and there's a little bit more room down here. Like the other cars, there is actually some stuff in here, but it's all removable. This is your tow kit and a tire repair kit. 
but you can take it all out if you don't want it and then you do get a little bit more room down here nowhere near as much as you get in that ford but quite handy and also this floor does fit into two levels if i can get it to do it now there you go it goes a bit lower and you've got some storage bits down here as well Still, if this Peugeot doesn't offer the premium punch that you really want, maybe this Volvo XC40R design will, because in this specification here, it costs from just over £27,000 on Cinch, and you get a load of kit for your money. In fact, this is a pretty posh model, so much so that I'd say buyers of Range Rover Evokes and other really premium models might consider this thing if they're looking for something a little bit more compact. Still very practical as well, and I think it may also be the best looking car here. I said I love that Puma, but come on, look at this thing. It looks excellent, doesn't it? Pretty nice inside as well. It's absolutely lovely in here. It really feels very premium, you know, comparable to a Range Rover Evoque or something like that in terms of glitz and just fit and finish. The materials are all quite nice. Okay, there's some harder touch plastics around, but everything's really well put together. And it actually feels really technically advanced because you've got a fully digital instrument cluster ahead of you here. The dials are really crisp and sharp. It looks very nice. I love the steering wheel. It's nice and simple, very Volvo with its slightly blocky center. And the most impressive thing I think actually about what's up front here is this infotainment system. It's maybe not as easy to learn to live with as the Volkswagen Group stuff, but once you get the hang of it, I think it's possibly the best one here. It's certainly the fastest to react and respond. Touchscreen like responses on the finger, on the screen, and the menus and everything are really aesthetically pleasing. And then you still get buttons down here for your volume and your radio controls, etc. So it's still very nice, but you do of course have to go into the screen to adjust your climate control. Not the end of the world, but some people don't like that stuff. You've got a manual six speed to go with that diesel engine. And there's a nice gearbox in this car. That engine's very punchy. It's quite lazy if you want it to be. So you don't really have to work this gearbox very hard. The car will just motor along at low revs. When it comes to the practicality, nice spacious seats, loads of room around me, decent side cubby holes down here, cup holders as well, and a bit of storage space under this armrest here. Actually quite a lot of storage space down here as well. And a single USB port down there. Actually not as many USB ports as you get in those other cars, but really up front here, it feels very technically advanced. Now in the back of the Volvo, it still feels really premium. It helps of course that you've got these part leather seats, good space. Feet go under the front of the seat here. Lots of knee room as well here. Certainly not the most, but pretty good. Lots of headspace up top. I can move my head around here. Lots of room at the top of my head and then to the side as well. And the seats themselves feel really wide, nice and supportive and cushioned. I don't think this middle seat's quite as big as the ones in, that we mentioned in the T-Cross and that Kamik, but it's still pretty good actually. And it feels very premium. Also, one interesting thing is just how small these rear windows are. They are electric, of course, but it's a tiny square shaped window. I think it's a design feature because you've got this upward angle here on the rear section. But if you like big windows, maybe you've got a dog that hangs out the back. They might find this little window a little bit annoying, but I don't know. It looks good on design, doesn't it? Now on paper, the boot of this Volvo XC40 has just over 450 liters of space. And I think most of that is because it's quite wide. In fact, it's a really wide boot here. I think you'd get a big full size suitcase in this way or maybe even this way as well and of course you get a smaller one and probably a child suitcase on top especially if you move this parcel shelf out under the floor here you've got more storage space so you've got room over here and then room a bit deeper down here so it's not the most underfloor storage but actually overall this is a really really big boot very practical indeed Oh, and I should add that while this is a diesel XC40, you can, of course, get petrol models and electrified versions, including a fully electric car. So if you're into that kind of stuff, you should definitely check this one out. This, on the other hand, does things a little bit more simply. It's a Citroen C3 Aircross, and, well, it's very French indeed. Look at it. It's super quirky and super fun. And actually, really good value for money. Like that Skoda, you get a lot for not a lot. This car here, with just over 15,000 miles on the clock starts at just over 13,400 pounds. You can get cars for just over 11 grand on cinch.co.uk. And I mean, that is tremendous value for money given the size of these things. Now under the bonnet of this car is a 1.2 pure tech engine. It's a three cylinder petrol engine. Citroen claims just over 55 miles per gallon and you get about 110 horsepower. So like the other cars here, especially the other petrol ones, it's punchy and relatively fuel efficient. And it actually sounds pretty nice as well. These three cylinders sound great. Quirky design everywhere, especially inside.
Now, there are a few shared parts in this car actually with that Peugeot we spoke about earlier, and straight away I can see the similarity in the infotainment system here, but this is a much quirkier car. That car is quite premium, and as we said, it had a few unique Peugeot racy touches. This thing is just mad, it's just bonkers in here. You don't even get round dials for the instrument cluster there slightly squared off at the edges and all the digits and dials come in this quite fun font. I think it's going to be quite divisive in terms of whether you like it or not, but certainly it's quite interesting. When it comes to the techie stuff, little digital screen in the middle between the two instrument cluster dials, the steering wheel itself gets a few buttons and this infotainment screen, not the biggest, but pretty clear and sharp. Certainly not the fastest to respond, but acceptably good. And then when it comes to actual space around me here, these seats are really big and very squared off. So it means they're actually really comfortable. Not much in terms of lumbar support or anything like that, but they're just really wide. I think all body shapes are gonna be comfortable in this car. And you get a bit of storage space as well. Really wide cubby holes down here. The only thing with comparable cubby holes is that T-Cross. This thing down here, you kind of get two cup holders in there as well to go with the ones you get up here. You've got a USB port down here as well. Uh, yeah, five-speed manual gearbox as well to go with that little three-cylinder engine. But like the earlier five-speeds, the thing with these engines is they do settle down quite well. Okay, on the motorway, it's not going to be the most efficient and refined cruiser. But honestly, you won't really have much trouble unless you're towing a big trailer on the back. I have to say, I'm not entirely sure why we have to have such a big handbrake in this car. I guess they're trying to be quirky with it, but it's pretty massive. Look at that thing there. Although, having said that, when you fold it down, it does clear up a lot of space down there. You've got a tiny bit of storage space down there. I think you can get a cup in there as well. So functional, quirky, very Citroen. In the back, it's a medium amount of space, I'd say. I can put my feet under the front seat, again, set as I like it up here. And I've got a bit of knee room as well because the seat is pinched ahead of me here. And actually the headroom is pretty good. But when it comes to the width, these seats aren't quite as wide as the other ones we've seen earlier. This middle seat is pretty wide actually by comparison. I think they're more even across the three rows. But again, I wouldn't want to be an adult sat in the middle seat for a very long time. No surprises there really. Fine for the morning commute though. An interesting thing that I've noticed about this interior is if I do this, I can actually slide forward this side of the bench and keep my seat back. I can do that in the opposite direction as well. As you can imagine, this thing can go forward, these can come back. And that means you've got a bit more versatility, a bit more flexibility in how you arrange the interior of this car, whether you've got smaller kids in these seats here and you need to put some bigger stuff in the boot or the complete opposite, whether everyone's really tall and you want to sacrifice some boot space, which we can check out just now. So with those seats in an even, positioning ahead. The boot here is actually not the biggest. In fact, it's about 410 litres of space, which effectively means you can get one big suitcase in here. And maybe if you took this parcel shelf off, you could get a medium sized one on top. There is extra space under here. However, not a bad amount, actually pretty decent. It's a bit thin, but it's quite wide. And if you lift this other layer of floor, you'll find your tire repair kit and your actual uh, toe eye down here where there would be a spare tire. If you remove all of that, of course, you're going to get even more room as well, more than what is quoted on the spec sheet. So yeah, very, very good value for money. You get what you pay for though, when it comes to the space. But of course, as we've shown, there's so much choice in this class. Go on cinch.co.uk and you can find even more. This is a popular category for good reason. There's lots and lots to choose from. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, click that like button and of course, click the subscribe button because we have Rockingham Raceway. And of course, we don't just drive crossovers. Sometimes we drive things that are very fast. Watch out for that. See you soon.